Script 5. Conversation between James and Zafarun. James, you know the drama project, Zafarula. Yes. James, do you think there was any connection between it and the massacre? Zafarula. Of course there was. James. Oh. Zafarula. Yes. Of course. James. Why? Zafarula. Because everything is connected. One thing done at one moment must in some way affect the future. James. Directly. Zafarula. Does it matter? James. I'm not sure. Zafarula, that doesn't mean there's fault. <coughs> James, but if there's a link, there's responsibility. Zafarula, connection doesn't mean cause. <coughs> James, I'm not so sure. Zafarula, all things, I believe, all things are interrelated. <coughs> James. But then, without the drama project, the massacre wouldn't have happened. Zafarula, I'm not saying that. James, perhaps I am. Script 6, in which the story moves back and forward across time. In July 2000, I was staying in a small guest house with Sri Lankan colleagues above the town of Bandarawal. <coughs> Bandarawala is probably one of the most ethnically diverse towns in the whole of Sri Lanka. It is roughly a third Sinhalese, a third Tamil, and a third Muslim. Muslims speak Tamil, but I identify differently. Each day we would prepare our workshops and our exercise of what we were going to do, drive through Bandarawala, down the hill, towards the small village of Bindanawewa. And Bindanawewa was 100% Sri Lankan Sinhalese Buddhist. And then, stopping briefly in the village, we'd zigzag up the hairpin bends towards the camp. On the way, there's a Buddhist temple. Now this Buddhist temple was famous at the time of the massacre, because outside this temple is where the crowds first gathered, organized by the local high priest. And it's the high priest who helped the crowds gather and then walk up the road towards the police post and assemble around the edges of the camp here. On our typical day, we would drive into the centre, say good morning to the police officer here, and then go towards the playing field. And the playing field, we might join in the game of cricket, chat, have a cup of tea with the young men, or go to Captain Abaratna's house and office up here, and maybe talk to him. But then we would move rapidly to the three barracks that made up the centre. And these are the barracks where we did the work. First barrack was mostly for accommodation. This one here was accommodation, but also most of the classes were held. And this is where all our theatre workshops took place. And the final barrack 
had a series of shrines. There was a Buddhist shrine here, a Hindu one around the corner, and a small Christian altar in the corner here. And this barrack is where we took all the photographs of the project. At the time of the massacre, all the men were assembled around the barracks. They were also around here, because this is where people cooked, washed, and prepared for the day. Around the edges of the camp were the police vehicles, but also the police, the police were inside the boundaries of the camp. And the men were assembled here, and the crowds were assembled here, and they were throwing rocks and abuse inside the camp, and the boys were shouting back from here. And at some point, this crowd charged across the playing field mm. towards the center. Originally, the boys hid in this first barrack, but very quickly it was set alight. And they then had to jump into this one, and then finally into this one. Each barrack was then burnt down in turn. Most of the boys died from machete, or sort of club style injuries, or they were burnt to death, particularly in these final two barracks. Some of the boys tried to flee in this direction, towards the police vehicles, but they were fired upon. At least one boy died from a bullet in his back, and one of the survivors had the three fingers on one of his hands shot off. So many of them fled, ran back into the site of the massacre. During our workshops, we would spend long breaks sat on the stoops that there were to each of the barracks, a series of steps going up into each barrack. And we sat there and talked to the boys about their lives, about their dreams, and about their ambitions. And looking from here, you could see the mountains in the distance. And the boys would explain how much they liked this place. They predominantly came from coastal, much drier areas, and they loved the mountains, the greenery. But above all, they said, they loved it because it was out of the war zone and they felt safe. <coughs> In 2006, with some Sri Lankan colleagues, I was preparing a commemoration project dedicated to the massacre. And we were staying in the town of Bandarawala this time. And we interviewed, pe interviewed people from the town about what they thought about the massacre, what they knew about the massacre. And many of them explained they still felt that the Tamil Tigers were hiding in the hills, ready to exact their revenge. Again, we took the trip down the valley towards the village of Bindunawewa. This time, the first day we were there, rather than going up the hill, we went up the hill to this other side. And there was a restaurant and guest house up the hill the other side. And it was run by someone called Lalit. And Lalit was the candidate for a Sinhala extremist uh, political party called Sihala Arumia. And in the period before the massacre, this organization had been campaigning to have the center closed down. Their argument was this demonstrated that the government cared more about the human rights of Tamils than the human rights of the people who were living in this village. Alit explained to us how he was happy now the centre had been closed, but he also promised that he had nothing to do with the massacre. After our lunch with Alit, we went up the hill and back to the Buddhist temple. And we asked a young monk there whether we could speak to the high priest, since he featured in so much of the documentation about the massacre. But he said, I'm oh, sorry, the high priest isn't here. He's, he's gone, he's not around. And as we left the temple to continue up the road, the high priest came out of his office. 
and he shooed us away, almost violently shooed us away, saying there's nothing more to say. Go away. Stop talking about this incident. So we left, walked up the hill, and to the police post that now had a barrier across it. So we couldn't go in. So we drove our vehicle around the edge and parked exactly where the crowds had gathered. And from here, you can just about make out the corners of the freshly painted barracks that had now been renovated. And I remember looking up at those barracks. And I remembered all the stories that had come out about why the centre had been created. And all the stories that emerged about who was to blame for the massacre. And I also remembered how a theatre project had been incorporated into those stories far too easily. And I swore never again would I let that happen. This document here <coughs> is the Presidential Commission into the Massacre of Bindan Uweiwa, and it's never been published. Page 46. Professor Harendra de Silva, in his testimony before the Commission, pointed out that the psychological rehabilitation, which is an important area in the process of rehabilitation, has not received adequate attention and its rightful place until the year 2000. Professor de Silva further placed before the Commission certain meaningful steps taken to train the working staff, namely, A. An opportunity was afforded to Captain Abiratna and Captain Mahanama to attend a conference in Congo in December 1999. B. A seminar for training of officers on basics of counselling with Dr. Chris Hobbs and Dr. Helga Hanker, UK, in February 2000, was held at the Bindan Uweiwa Centre. This was sponsored by the UK government. C. Counselling programme by Dr. Elizabeth Yareg, Norway, in March 2000. D. Counselling programme, Conflict Resolution Through Theatre by James Thompson, UK, in July 2000. In his submission, Professor De Silva has referred to the keen interest shown by the Foreign Minister in the rehabilitation work. The government thought the rehabilitation programme went well. They even used it as a showpiece. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. That was a very powerful demonstration of the motto that everything matters. Um, so, um, James would be happy to accept any questions. started to come up about the theater project being involved in people's thoughts. I, I think you said that you would never let that happen again. Uh, so what, can, I don't know if there have been similar projects after, what would you describe if you were doing another project, how you might avoid that a, a similar situation ever occurring again? Oh, is this one? Um, if I speak like this, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's solved. Um, uh, that is the, that's the $6 million question. Um, part of the answer is there is a big bunch of projects over here that just should not be done. 
but I think we, we, we need to think very, very carefully about the context in which we're working, the people sponsoring those projects, why they want those projects in the first place, mm -hmm. for whom those projects actually work, mm -hmm. and really are they working for the participants or whoever you work. So there is a bunch of projects that I think we need to just step back from. On the projects that I think are still entirely legit legitimate and amazingly powerful, it's about understanding the, the social, political and cultural context in which the, it is situated. And who is possibly going to manipulate your presence, the event itself, the type of activity you're doing, and whether those in any way outweigh the benefits to the people that you're working with. Um, and I think there are many projects like that where the context is, is perfectly legitimate. Um, but I still think every context is, uh, particularly in war zones, clearly that's what we're talking about. Um, every context is very difficult. War zones, one of the classic things to say about war zones is there are places of competitions for, for narratives. You have, pl there are places of competing stories. Um, we always talk slightly glibly about the importance of telling stories. Mm -hmm. in, in war zones, stories get you shot and killed. Yeah. So sometimes we need to be careful about whether our work is incorporated into stories that we don't want it to be part of. And if we're confident that it can be somehow a critical voice in the narratives that exist, or certainly working for some sort of notion of justice or human rights within those contexts, then I think we can safely do the work. But I think we need to always take a step back and try and look at the sort of work we're doing. There's a question behind you, Tracy. So, following what you just said, how can you tell whether your project has legitimacy or not? Do you have a criteria? What do you do? Um, I think uh, your, the knowledge, your personal or your group's knowledge of the, the context in which you're working is a vital starting point. Um, and an understanding of uh, if you're working in, in a context where you're speaking the same language as the community you're working with, or you are part of that community or external to that community, it's acknowledging and understanding what those relationships mean. Uh, and I think there's a whole set of things that you can you could think about. Very simply, in Sri Lanka, um, uh, I'm I'm British, and therefore and I speak English. And immediately, therefore, that positions me in terms of a particular colonial history in relation to Sri Lanka. And if you somehow aren't aware of your role as a British person in that context, you are missing a huge, big chunk of, of, of the situation. If you speak one of the two community languages in Sri Lanka, then again, if you don't understand what happens when you use that language in certain settings, then you'll be missing something from that setting. So it's understanding who you are, who you're working with, the languages you're using, what, what baggage you bring in your very body um, before you open your mouth. Uh, if you work for UNICEF, already you come with a certain type of authority because of the nature of UNICEF. Mm -hmm. And therefore that opens doors that you might not want opening. So that it's, it's understanding the web in which your work is situated. And each situation provides a different set of webs to try and unravel. Inigo had a question there. Thank you, Ned. It was really fantastic. But could you develop more why this relation between, you know, when, when this James in, in the script five, that, that, that dialogue, why do you think that is this relation of the project, theater project, and the massacre? Can you develop more of that link? Um, I think also that you feel guilty about it. So can you I, I develop think, more of that? <laughs> I think it's really important. It's, it's important for, for this work to be pulled apart to try and work out what that link may be. Um, I think. Uh, one of the uh, reasons a lot of people locally were opposed to this center was because they felt disproportionately this group of, in their mind, terrorists were getting um, higher amounts of resources than they were getting in their village. 
and the sort of resources they got was internationals visiting them. I was one of those internationals that was seen to be visiting them. So there is a sense that part of the narrative that existed here was that this was part of a tradition of the government supporting terrorists and not supporting local people. And therefore, all the activities were read through that lens. Ah, here's a bunch of white folk coming. That's proof, once again, that all the UN, the international community, all they're interested in is supporting the terrorists. And they give nothing to us. Their water was quite scarce in this village, but there was a bowser, you know, a water uh, carrier that was stationed just around here so that they had access to water. So very basically, the community here felt that they had better facilities than they, they had. So there is a sense that the theatre project in micro was part of a, was easily consumed in some other narratives. And for Lakshman Kadagama, he needed that sense that this was proof that the Sri Lankan government was treating uh, internees with great human rights respect and helping them out, re rehabilitating them. So he needed that sense of internationals and UNICEF in particular working there because it proved his story about why the place was. So the, the theatre project was embedded and became embedded in those two separate stories. Dangerously, perhaps. <laughs>